Welcome to our course, Introduction to Comparative Politics. This week, we will be discussing the origins of one of the most important issues of our contemporary times. That is global gap, which means the global economic and wealth inequality between and within nations in 21st century. So we will be discussing this issue in a much more broader, much more historical and much more theoretical perspective over the foundational texts of two important scholars. First one is André Gunder Frank that I will be discussing with this video and the next one will be on Hai Jun Chang. Okay, let's start with the first scholar. But before doing that, let me tell you about the historical context of the emergence of global gap or global inequality. Actually, in the start of 19th century, we see a sort of equal distribution of wealth and resources in the global realm. Like the total wealth of Europe, India and China were around like 20 or 25 percent of global GDP of the time. However, when we came to the end of 19th century, actually we realized that the European powers now had like more than 80% of all global wealth and resources. So we see a like huge, tremendous transformation in this particular century, in 19th century. And we can discuss like at least three important sources of this changing distribution of resources. The first one is, or actually all of these are related to the Industrial Revolution, which emerged in late 18th century. After achieving the Industrial Revolution, Great Britain actually increased its economic and military wealth and capabilities. However, like although the Industrial Revolution is related to the revol revolutionary improvements in the textile industry which meant that like Great Britain thanks to the Industrial Revolution could produce higher volumes of goods with cheaper costs higher volumes of textile goods with cheap, cheaper costs actually like the Indian textile was still seen as a like competitive market for the Great Britain so they were still providing or producing like high quality textiles which was actually trendy to use like Indian goods at that time. So when in when Great Britain like colonized India in early 19th century, actually one of the first things that they did, that they have done was to deindustrialize the India and shut down most of the textile factories in the territory in order to eliminate an important competitive player in the textile market, which was a very crucial sector for Great Britain at that time. After deindustrializing this huge country, actually Great Britain turned it into an agriculture-based economy. And the Indians were forcefully, uh, they were forced to produce or to cultivate a very particular like uh, good, which is poppy, like the raw material of opium. Then they have actually like captured, they have taken these raw materials, these poppies, turned them into final goods like opium and forcefully sold this to China. When Chinese emperor at that time rejected this foreign trade, actually they like waged the war against the emperor won the war and forcefully accepted or forced China to accept this foreign trade or like pouring of opium into his territories. Like this opium trade was very like in 1840s and 50s and 60s actually it was the most important sector for Great Britain in terms of its foreign income. So only the opium trade like between Great Britain and uh, China or the Britain's export of opium to China 
actually made up, according to some cal calculations, made up 40% of all British foreign income. So it's a very important one. Which were made possible first as a result of industrial revolution and increasing economic and military capabilities of Great Britain. Second, the exercise or the usage of these capabilities in order to colonize India. Third, the industrialization of a competitive market, a competitive player in the textile industry sector, India. Fourth, forcefully turning India into an, into an agricultural economy, producing high volumes of puppies. And fifth, like taking these puppies and turning them into final goods, opium, and selling these to China. So we see kind of a triangle here, like impoverishing. Both India, both India and China, and like increasing the prosperity and economic wealth of Great Britain. Later on, like uh, especially in the second half of nineteenth century, like the the initiation of industrial revolution in Great Britain also trickled down or diffused to other European countries as well. So they have also emulated or copied like the techniques and strategies and policies of Great Britain. And they also started to like catch up with Britain or industrialize their economies, which not only increased their economic prosperity, but also greatly enhance their military capabilities and uh, military supremacies, which led like even the very tiny countries such as Belgium to colonize like 80 times bigger country like Congo. So like in the 19th century we see the increase or widening gap between the West and rest with regards to their economic and military capabilities which facilitate the process of colonization and further increased this disparity between two regions or between the West and the rest of the world. So, however, like although this, this story like tells and greatly shows why the inequality increased in 19th century, actually until maybe uh, 1950s and 60s, it still doesn't tell us why we are witnessing still the increase in the wealth and in economic inequality between the nations and within the nations. So there are actually several explanations developed to account for this phenomenon. Like uh, according to some liberal like mainstream arguments actually the rest of the world like the third world or the developing countries they are still like in an backward stage of economic development and industrialization. So they will catch up with the Western countries, like the prosperous ones, by following the path these Western countries are uh, adopted during their industrialization. So they will be also become they will also become really richer by like following the stages followed by the Western countries. So they this is one of the first assumptions or premise of this liberal mainstream account. And the second one actually suggests that in order to promote the development of these non-Western territories, like we need to diffuse the like capital institutions and the values from these rich Western countries to developing non-Western territories. However, Andre Gunder Frank actually is directly against this idea, like challenging this mainstream view. And he is rather saying that, like these non Western territories, so they are not poor or they lack prosperity, not because of they don't have the necessary market institutions or not because of they are not integrated in the global market economy. But 
it is because of the particular way that they are integrated into global market economy. So, he rather says that there is an unequal, unequal division of labor in the global realm. So, we are seeing like rich, like technology heavy and capital incentive metropole countries such as United States, United Kingdom, Germany, maybe Canada, like uh, almost most of these Western countries, like the prosperous ones that everyone knows, and the satellite countries which are or which have extractive economies or agriculture based economies. So like and there is an unequal, like unprecedented unequal exchange of goods and services between these two parts of the world. For example, like United States is exporting, let's say, Apple, maybe with hundreds of dollars, but they, like, for example, Dominic Republic is just, in turn, exporting, like, bananas, or Sierra Leone is just exporting, like, cacao, raw material of, like, chocolate. However, in order to, like, meet this, or the equivalent of just one, very single Apple product can only be purchased with the selling of maybe hundreds of kilos or tons of agricultural goods and raw materials. So, like, by let's say playing with the current rules of the game, these third world countries can never catch up with the first one, first world ones. By just selling bananas or cacaos and like buying apples or like high technology heavy like uh, expensive goods, right? So like Andrew Gunder Frank is underlining this issue in the global market economy. He says that like there is a flow of wealth not from the Western world to the rest of the world. But from the rest of the world to the Western world, side, side, for example, in Sierra Leone, like, like people are like working in plantations, like tens of people working in these plantations. They are just cultivating cacaos. They are just selling these cacaos to international firms such as Nestle. Sometimes they are owned by, or they are co-owned by, let's say, Sierra Leonean people or domestic businessmen. Or they are exclusively owned by international, let's say, shareholders, based on the uh, different domestic circumstances. So, like when these farmers that like, produce these cacaos, it is just like bought by these international companies or local brands of these international companies with very ridiculous prices, and then they are moved. Or then they are even turned to, let's say, final good chocolate in some other countries or, 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 or in the same place or in the first world. And sold to the first world market with like, very high prices compared to what the original farmers are earning outside of this transaction. Or, so, like, Andre Gunder Frank is arguing that, like, even after the era of decolonization ended, like these first world countries, although their formal political hegemony or control or domination over these territories ended, they still sustained their economic primacy or domination over these territories through their international firms and companies. And as long as these countries are integral, like persist their like integration into the capitalist economic system in the global realm through this particular channel by taking place in this exploitative division of labor as the producer of let's say agricultural goods or extractor of raw materials they can never catch up the first world western countries according to Gunder Frank so just to summarize, like the liberal views arguing that, okay, folks, you will get richer as long as you follow our paths and our prescriptions. And in order to like enrich you, we need to like diffuse our 
techniques and let's say values or institutions to your territory. But Andrea Winterfriend says that no, this is not how the game is played. Like even if you are claiming that you are diffusing these institutions or like values and capital after the era of decolonization, still the gap didn't close. Actually, it increased, rapidly increased, because like these countries are, again, part of these economic transactions or economic markets, periphery markets, but the way that they are particular, particularly integrated into this world economic system actually reproduces their underdevelopment. So, we see the development of underdevelopment in these territories went hand in hand with the growing prosperity or with the development of these first world countries. So there is not another diffusion or that there is a trickle down mechanism here. There is a trend towards growing and widening gap between the West and the West as a result of these reasons, according to Andre Gunderfan. So thanks so much for listening this brief video. Uh, in the next one, I will be discussing Hajun Chang's view. So he is also providing a like very important and very significant challenge to this liberal orthodoxy, as we will be discussing soon. Okay, thanks so much. Take care of yourself. See you in the next video.